this last warning message to the world, that we might be prepared to give that message, that we might be able to join in. Lord, as we come before your throne, we just come before you bare. We ask for forgiveness of all of our sins, that you forgive us for all of our pride, all of our fear, all of our unbelief, all of our unforgiveness and bitterness. Come into our hearts, Lord, and Lord, use us as broken vessels. Use us in amazing ways that we might just be amazed by your goodness, amazed by your willingness to work with people like us. Now, as we come before your throne, we pray that you might anoint the lips and bless the mind of our brother here, Eric, and that he might speak clearly and that we might understand what it is that is being said. So, Lord, as we move forward in this, we thank you because we know you've heard our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. And we just want to thank the Lord for the prayer we had. And I want to welcome everyone here. And as we look at our subject this morning, three steps, the three angels' messages. And um, if you don't mind, I, I, I customarily have a word of prayer, so I just want to give us just a word of prayer. Father in heaven, again, we just thank you and ask that you will be with us as we just spend these moments together. We pray you will grant wisdom and understanding, be with my mouth and prepare our hearts, Lord, and give me the words that I should speak. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at this subject today, this morning, we're going to look at some, some principles that is important to understand as we, um, as we look at this, recognizing that the three angels' message is something that's beyond this earth. There's a need to, um, to understand this in the way that God would have us. So we want to start out here, and there's a statement we find in the Spirit of Prophecy where Ellen White was given a, um, she was given a message from God and she was giving it to us. And this is what she says. She says, I saw a company who stood well guarded and firm, giving no countenance to those who would unsettle the established faith of the body. Now, as we go through and look at whether it's the Bible or any aspect of the spirit of prophecy, God has given us a way that we should study his word. And we're, some of us may be familiar with it, maybe from one or two different um, directions. Some know it as the proof text method, if you're familiar with that term. Some others may know it by Miller's Rules. And, um, of course, they're not Miller's Rules. They were given to Miller. Miller adopted them, but we call them Miller's Rules. And so we utilize these rules because as we utilize these rules, it allows us to get a, a view of what God wants us to understand the way he wants us to understand it. All right? So... Um, so for that reason, we're going to use that approach as we go through. So one of the rules, the very first rule says that every word must have its proper bearing upon the subject. And so as we look at this, we, we, we recognize it says that a company, I saw a company who stood well guarded. They were well guarded. They were, they, 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 they in their dealings, they were a guarded people. They weren't loose in their dealings. They were firm. They would not veer to the left or to the right, and they gave no countenance to those who would unsettle the established faith of the body. So they were, they stayed on point. 
They didn't allow anyone to turn them away from that which God has given us as truth. All right? And then she says that God looked upon them with approbation, with joy, with uh, some you know, appreciation. And then she says, I was shown, what? Three steps. God showed her three steps, and then he told her what those steps were. They were the first, the second, and the third angel's messages. Now, she said, I was shown three steps. And what comes to my mind is three steps, right? And so when we look at steps, steps have a purpose, right? So my question when we start looking at these steps, what is the purpose of steps? Steps are designed to do what? To, to go up, right? Okay. It's to take us from a low elevation to a higher elevation, right? Okay. And then she says that they are the first, the second, and the third angel's messages coming from early writing. So these steps... You have the first, the second, and the third angel's messages. Which is very interesting is that, and we're going to see it here, there's a, there's a principle here that God is bringing together. And we'll, we're going to have a text here that we'll show that in just a little bit. Matter of fact, it's right here. 1 Corinthians 2.14. And we can read that together. It says what? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are what? Spiritually discerned. So what this text is telling us that as natural men and women, we cannot understand the things that are what? Of God. Right? Because those things that are of God function in the spiritual realm, right? And so those things because they're beyond us, they're above us, is foolishness to us. A lot of times we hear, if you visit a Sunday church, you hear people talking in tongues, right? It's really something because they are taught to do that. But they are telling us that why we don't understand it is because they're talking in the language of the Spirit, right? So if it were, if that was correct, what we hear is what? Is gibberish, is foolishness, right? And so, so, you know, I don't believe that they are doing that because those things that are above us, how can we learn those things to teach other people, right? So, the Lord is telling us in his word that in order for these things that are in the spiritual arena to be understood, they have to be what? spiritually discerned, all right? So that, that requires something, again, that is apart from us. We must have it in order to understand it. It becomes the bridge that takes what we don't know in the spiritual arena, and it brings it into the arena where we can understand. Does that make sense? Okay, next scripture says in second, uh, 1 Corinthians, 1546, it says, how be it, that was not which is spiritual, or that, how be it, that was not first, excuse me, which is spiritual, but that which is what? Natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. When we look at this text, we have to first understand the purpose of this text. And the purpose of this text is that we might understand how to receive and understand spiritual things. Let me, let me, let me make it a little clearer. We know that everything that took place in existence took place first where? In the natural or in the spiritual? In the spiritual, right? We know that we are, we recognize we're in the great controversy here on earth. But this great controversy started where? It started in heaven. And the Bible tells us that how many things are new 
that never existed above the sun. <laughs> Nothing. Everything that exists happened under the sun has happened before, right? Somewhere else. The only other place is where? Above the sun. It happened in heaven. So things always began in the spiritual. Right? So, correct, correct. So, in this text deals with our education. So when it comes to education, we're told that the spiritual is not to be first because we cannot learn from the spiritual. It says, first is not the spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. So in other words, we have to first learn the natural things that we're familiar with on this earth, and God will use those things to teach us about the things that are spiritual, the things that we don't know. Example, remember Christ told Moses to build me a sanctuary, right? That was made after the pattern of a sanctuary in heaven. So Moses was given a pattern and he made it on earth. And as we learn about that process of the sanctuary message, we learn about those things that are taking place where? In heaven. So, so this, this method of learning is the naturalist first, and it teaches us about the spiritual. Okay? So this is the only way that we can learn about the spiritual things because the spiritual things are beyond us. We can't see them. But as we understand the natural, we understand the spiritual. All right? So that's uh, understanding spiritual things 101. First comes the natural, then the spiritual. And this is something that Christ did all the time, right? When he taught people, he taught them in parables. The, the, the sower went out to sow, right? And we know that he taught that the seed that the sower sowed was what? It's the word of God, right? And so he utilizes the things of nature, the things around us, to teach us about the things of the spirits or in the spiritual arena, all right? So she says, I was shown three steps. All right, we have step one, step two, and step three. So as we understand what steps are and how they function, how they operate, we can better understand the application of these messages, All right? So we saw earlier that steps are something you what? You go up with, right? In this picture, we see steps are what? It's a process in which you go what? Through, right? So there's different applications of what steps are. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so this is how we're able to understand more and expand our understanding of the three angels' messages, right? They're designed to take us up to a higher level, right? Right? Said my accompanying angel in the same quote, she says, woe to him who shall move a block or store a pin of these messages. So these messages, these three angels' messages, if they were to be, if a block was to be moved, let me tell you a quick story. There was a gentleman, he ran, he, he, he managed a, 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 a building. He took care of the maintenance in that building. And over time, he noticed that there was cracks above all the windows and the doors. And they would fix it up with plaster, and then they would come back again. They would fix it up with plaster, and they, keep, they would keep coming back. So he made a phone call to the company that built that building. They put him in touch with the engineer, and he explained to them what's going on. So he, he, he uh, told them, I'm going to come out there, and I'm going to inspect your building to find out what's going on, because that should never be happening. So anyhow, the, on the particular day he was to come out, the, uh, the gentleman, the maintenance supervisor, was waiting there for him. The engineer came, and he went downstairs deep into the basement of the building. Time passed. Where is this engineer? Company, and the company said, he's on the site. So as he looked around, he talked to the, uh, the, the desk. They said, he's down in the basement. 
So he went down to the basement and he said, Mr. Engineer, you're in the wrong place. You need to be, the problem is up in the upper portions of the building. The engineer told him, no, your problem is down here in the foundation. And he took him to certain areas and he found that in the walls of the, of the, um, of the building, in the foundation, those big cylinder blocks were missing all throughout the wall. Someone had been taking them out, cutting them out, and they found that they were, gonna, they were using them to build their own home. So as they were taking blocks out of that building, it was causing that building now to become fragile. It, 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 was, where it was becoming problematic even to the point where it would become dangerous where people could lose their lives, right? So when we start moving blocks, it can be a very dangerous thing. So when we start looking at these messages, the Lord is telling us that if we move any of the blocks, the foundation or the pieces of those blocks, moving things around, it could be fatal to people because it can turn them in the wrong direction, right? So it's important that these messages stay the way God gave them, okay? Because they can have some serious, serious problems. So let's look at this here. The three steps. Now, we're gonna look at some other, uh, another dynamic as we look at these three steps. We have the first, the second, and the third angel's message. We know their steps are designed to take us a little higher. Matter of fact, when we look at the three angels' messages themselves, we know that they are designed, that the first angel's message is always a life and death message. When I say always, that may sound kind of crazy. But the pen of inspiration says that the three angels' messages began to be heralded from Eden, when God pronounced enmity to be put between the woman and the serpent. And that's when the first three angels' messages took off, all right? And so all through history, the three angels' messages has been sounding all through history from that top standpoint. So when we look at the first angels' messages, it's always what? It's a life and death message, right? And that life and death message, message points us to, to the third angel's message. Because the third angel's message is about what? Judgment, right? So the first angel's message always points to the third. And it warns us because it's dealing with your life and it's dealing with your death, or death, one of the two, right? So it warns us, and then it prepares us. If we respond properly, it leads us to the second angel's messages, which then prepares us for the judgment, so that we will have a favorable judgment if we follow along, all right? So, so we always see this dynamic, the first, Tells you about the third, prepares you for the second, and, and prepares you again for the third. So it's a life and death message. The second angel's message is always a visual message or visual test. It's something you must see with your eyes. You must see it with your eyes. It's a visual test. And then the third angel's message is a closed door message. We can explain this. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a very uh, specific application of this. Okay, as you look at in the uh, in the antediluvian world prior to the flood, we know the Bible tells us that God looked amongst the antediluvians and He saw that there was. The Bible says that there was only one righteous man, right? And who who was that? That was Noah. And he told Noah that he was going to do what? Destroy the earth with a flood. 
And so Mo Noah, God raised up Noah to give a message and to prepare a boat to save him, his family, and everyone else that will come upon that ark. And so Noah's message was a message of what? Of repentance. He was preaching to the people, right? So he preached to the people. He's telling them that a flood was going to come. His message, which is to do repent of your sins, put away all of your sinful work, and prepare for the judgment, because if you don't prepare for it, it's going to sweep you away. It's going to destroy you. Why? Because God is going to destroy the earth. So that message points them to the third. All right? So as time went on, were the people obedient? Some started to obey. Some didn't. And some got caught up and they went back, right? We're told in the book Prophets and Kings that the animals were obedient to the message. And Sister White tells us that the, that the animals were displaying works of righteousness. So they were obeying that call to do what? To get onto the ark. All right? So the first message was put away your sin. The second angel's message was get on the ark. And so as Noah was building that ark, people came out to see him. And as they came out to see him, they heard the message of what? Of repentance, the first angel's message. Matter of fact, White says in the book, Patriots and Prophets, that the whole world, everyone heard that message, right? And then as they got close to finish building that ark, there was a lot of excitement. People came back because they knew something was going to happen. They didn't know what. But when they came back, all of the animals started to come into the ark two by two or seven by seven, right? All that was going to get on the ark. The birds came as well. And they got on the ark. So they were acting out the second angel's message as the people should have, right? And then after they all went onto the ark, the people in amazement, Patriots and Prophets goes on to tell us that they all saw the next phenomena. And what was that? That was the an angel was descending from heaven. It says that they slowly descended and came to that door. And as that angel was closing the door, the door was closing slowly. Why do you think it was closing slowly? To give people opportunity at the last minute to do what? To obey that message and get on the ark before the what? The closed door. And when that door closed, Noah was, he was powerless to open it back up. And even when the rain started to come down and they recognized that judgment was on his way, it was not turning back. They did everything they could to get on that ark. But what happened? The door was shut. Right? So the antediluvians experienced the three angels' messages before their eyes. Right? And in every age of time, the three angels' messages have been sounding in a different application, but following the exact same pattern. Right? And this is important to understand because as we recognize the one, two, three angels' messages in past time, and they continue to sound, and we see how God works with them in the past, what does that teach us? It teaches us how he's going to work with us in our time, right? In the future time. So it helps us to, to build faith and confidence as we recognize and understand these three steps. Very important. It's much broader than that, but this is very important. It's a very uh, this is a synopsis of the three angels' messages, all right? But everyone follows this pattern, okay? So as we look at it, we have the three steps, the three angels' messages, and then we have it in Noah's day or Noah's timeline. And what is interesting is that when we look at Noah, 
in his time frame, what generation was Noah? What generation was Noah? He was number 10, right? When we look at the, deline the delineation from Adam on down, he was number 10. He was number 10. However, when we look at the second commandment, the Lord says he brings judgment when? In the fourth generation, right? So if we were to count in four generations, the last generation becomes the first again, Noah marks out to be a fourth generation, which according to the commandments is, is, um, is when judgment comes. So if we go down from Adam, we go to Canaan, we go to, what's it? I don't have it with me, but we can look at it later. But if we count four, the last generation, God always has a remnant, right? They begin the first generation. So we have the first four generations, and then the remnant starts a new first generation. Make sense? He was a fourth generation, right? So when we have the, the first generation, we have the second, third, fourth generation. So the, we have a remnant from that fourth generation, and he begins another first generation. So it starts all over again, right? Just like when God destroyed the earth with a flood, Noah was in the fourth generation. He was a fourth generation. Just, just follow me on this, right? So because he was a remnant and he destroyed the earth and Noah and his family were now the only ones alive, God had to begin with them. See that? Life continued with them because they're the only ones that were living at that time, right? So he had to begin his counting first generation again and then count down another four generations. Does that make sense? So that last generation again, one, two, three, four, judgment comes in the fourth generation because that's what God's word says. So when judgment comes, there's always going to be a remnant out of it. Why? Because God must preserve his seed. And he always starts over, right? So we know that God is going to destroy this earth again, but not with a flood this time. With what? Fire. But who is going to be saved out of this world? A remnant. Right? A remnant will be saved. And then God is going to start his new marriage because he's going to marry us, is he not? He divorces his old wife, which, you know, which is apostatized, but there will be a remnant out of it, which is his bride. And he's going to come down to get his bride when he comes a second, his second coming, right? So he's going to start all over again, brand new, just like he did in Noah's day after the flood. Make sense? All right. So in the fourth generation is the time when the three angels' messages always sounds, right? So the fourth generation, God said, hey, I've got to have a remnant. We've got to clean things back up because things have gotten so bad that God can't save that group of people. And it starts all over again, right? So it's always in the fourth generation that third angel message comes. That's a pattern. That's another pattern. He only sounds in the fourth generation. Okay? All right. Okay? Right. So now, when we look at this three-step principle, not only do we see it in the three steps, we see it in the three angels' messages, we also see it in the dream of Ellen White, like the first vision that Ellen White had. Right? Because the midnight cry was the first step. There was a light at the beginning of the path. Remember that vision that Ellen had? Remember? No. She saw 
she was looking for the seven people after the disappointment. And the angel told her, look a little higher. And with that, she raised her, 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 her sights, and she saw the people on a pathway from earth leading where? To heaven. And she said right before them, as she looked a little higher, because she was looking on the earth, they weren't on the earth, so she looked a little higher, second step, and she saw the Advent people traveling to the city, which is the third step. See that? The steps do what? Take you from a lower elevation to a higher elevation. And she said that she saw Christ right in the front leading them to the city. So, and then Christ raised his hand and he gave messages to the people. And she says it was a bright light that went over the Advent band. So you had the midnight cry. You had the light that came from Christ himself. And they were going to the city that needed no lights because he was the light. So we have the different lights getting brighter and brighter. And the Bible says that the path of the just is what? is as a shining light that does what? Get brighter and brighter until the perfect day. So the vision of Ellen White, her first vision, follows the same principle of the three steps, the three angels' messages. Also we find the sanctuary model. We all know this one. How many steps are in the sanctuary model? Three. We have what? The courtyard. What else do we have? The holy place and the, those are three steps. And if you follow those three steps, where does it take you? Right to the throne room of God. Right into his presence, right? And we know that the outer court is a symbol of this earth. Because this is where death took place, right? And death can only take place in one place in all existence. And that's where sin took place, which is on this earth. Isn't that something? And so it was symbolized in the courtyard by the bronze, the bronze uh, altar of sacrifice. It was made of, of two metals. It was an impure metal. Impurity only exists where? On this earth. Why? Because of sin. Okay. All right. So we see, thank you. For, the Bible says that he is He will do what? Convict of, convict of, and convict of, of judgment. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to lead us and to do what? And to guide us into how much? All truth. And so the promptings of the Holy Spirit teaches us that we need to confess our sin, do works of righteousness, and prepare for the judgment. And then we see in John 14, 6, Jesus is what? He is the, the way, the truth, and the life. So we cannot get to the Father unless we go through who? And he shows us the way to go. We're going to see something else here in a minute. And then in Revelation 17, 14, the Bible talks about three groups. They are the who? They that are with him are what? They're called, they're chosen, they're faithful. Very interesting. Because in the first angel's messages, it's a warning to do what? Repent of sin. And when we repent of our sin, automatically we're put on the way. Right? We are, or we're following Christ. He is the way. We are the called, and we are also, we have accepted Christ, because this is where his blood was shed. So when we accept him, we accept his blood. All this happens at the same time. That's in the first step. And then it does what? It, pre it prepares us, right, 
it prepares us to meet this judgment because if we hold on to our sin, we're going to meet the judgment, right? But it, if we respond in the right way, it leads us now. It puts us on the path of righteousness. We're now learning the works of righteousness. How are we learning it? Because we're studying truth, which is who? It's Jesus Christ, right? All right, these are the chosen. And as we, as we continue in that work, it prepares us for what? Judgment, which is what? Life, everlasting. And, and we are the, those will be the faithful. And so just as we recognize it in the, in the outer court, this is where you are what? You're justified. Just as if you had never sinned. Right? You sin, you die, you put that After learning truth, you start walking in that truth. That's a step, right? And, and how long does it take to become justified? Just like that, right? When you accept Christ, you're justified. And then you begin a walk, which is the walk of righteousness, right? And in the second compartment, that's the area where sanctification takes place, correct? Question, how long is the process of sanctification? It's a lifetime. So here, you're justified like that, and you begin a walk, your Christian walk, which takes your whole life. And then at the judgment, you receive that judgment of what? Glorification, right? So... All of these things follow these three steps. And what's interesting is this, is that when we see these clusters of three, this is, a, this is, a, one, of the, this is one of the ways or one of the, the marks that God is talking to his people. And he's seeking to teach us different aspects of the three angels' messages, right? And so as we learn these things, we'll see how God is leading us, directing us through this process. Isn't that awesome? Okay, let's, let's, let's finish up here in the same quote. Said my accompanying angel, woe to him who shall what? Move a block or stir a pin of these messages. She says the true understanding of these messages is of what? Violent in, uh, importance. So if there's a true understanding, there is a? A false understanding. So it's important that we understand the truth. And I want to say one last thing. I'm going to go back. If you note it, on that, I don't have a picture of it on here, but when Ellen White had that dream, where was, El where was Christ standing in these three steps? Sister White saw him with the people leading them where? To the city. So they hadn't gotten here yet. But they weren't back here either because she had to do what? Lift her heights, her sights up a little higher off of the earth, right? So he was at the second point. And Christ was dead smack right in the middle, right? And we find that the inspiration says that any message where Christ is not the center is not a message from heaven. All right? So Christ must be in the center. All right? So there's a true understanding of what we must have of these messages. It's of vital importance. She says that the what? The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are what? So based upon how you receive it or reject it determines what your destiny is going to be, right? Would you also realize that in the manner in which we receive, not just the attitude that we receive, but in the placement of our receiving those messages? Let me clarify what I'm saying. If you're going upstairs, sometimes we skip upstairs, right? If we're in a hurry, we just run upstairs, right? But can you skip? from the third, first step to the third step, and then the sixth step, and then the ninth step? Can you do that? No, no, no. It, it becomes very problematic, right? So the same way, if we were to shift those steps around, 
it's going to make the the it's going to make our climb a little more difficult. Would you? You make it a little more difficult, right? If you pos change those positions, right? And so remember, we read if you were to move a block or stir a pin, if we change those messages in any way, it will cause damage. So they must be received in their order. So if we receive, can we receive the third message before we receive the second message or the first message? They must come in there what? Their order. All right. So then, let me ask this question. When we became a church as Adventists, as Seventh-day Adventists, what message, what three angels' message did we come under when we were established? Was it the first? Was it the third? When did we become organized as a church? In 1863. And when did the first angel's message sound? The first angel. It came in 1798. And so the church wasn't in existence then, right? The second angel's message came when? 1843. Was the church organized then? The third angel's message came when? October 22nd, 1844. And we were organized when? Did I do that? And the church was organized in 1860, I'm sorry, in 1863, we were organized. So we came under the third angel's message. Right? The movement began when? Way back, further than that. But the church came under the third angel's message. So then, if we came under the third angel's message, what does that mean? Can't hear? If we came under the third, can you have a third angel's message without a first angel's message? Or a second angel's message. So what does that mean? We have to double back and get the first and the second in order to properly receive the third. Does that make sense? Okay. If, 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 if you look in the book, uh, er, um, Review and Herald, the fourth, the fourth book, if you look on page 109, the article in uh, uh, entitled The Ten Virgins. Read that article because the pen of inspiration says that the first, the second, and the third angel's message will be repeated in the church. Wow. That's the fourth, the fourth book. That's the hard volume set. Fourth book, page 109, article, The Ten Virgins. All right? Very powerful uh, article. She says it will be repeated in the church. All right? Now notice, notice this next part of the statement she says. I was again brought down through these messages and saw how dearly the people of God had purchased their experience so the three angels messages is what it's an experience it's something you have to go through you see that you have to go through it matter of fact it costs something you have to buy it it must be what purchased in order to have that experience when you purchase something who does it belong to you it belongs to you can anybody come and take it no, because you have, off, you have the, the receipt to prove that it's yours. So when you go through that experience, you purchase that experience with, we're going to see it in a minute. We purchase it with something right here. How is it purchased? It had been obtained or purchased through what? 
much suffering and severe conflict. They went through some stuff. Huh? The Bible says that Christ learned obedience through what? The things he suffered. You can't take that from him. Right? So the same way we, does it make sense now? In order for us to, to really experience the third angel's message, we have to go through the first and the second before we could ever get to the third. If we were to jump right to the third, do you think we could handle it? You couldn't. Let's go back to those lights. Remember the three lights? If you are sleeping in the dark, matter of fact, if, if you had, if you were in darkness for 30 days, pitch dark for 30 days, and someone came with a thousand watt or hundred and hundred thousand watt what uh, 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 light in your face, what will it do to you? It'll blind you. Your eyes can't handle it, right? So in order to, to bring you to that light, what must you first have? A small light. God always what? He meets us where we are. So he brings us a small light. That's why when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, he gave them light on the sanctuary, but it was a small light. He met them where they were, right? And then from that step, he goes to the next step, which is a brighter light, right? Our eyes can adjust. Preparatory for the what? The great light. Consequently, warning, if we were to go backwards and go down those steps, we're going to the lesser light, right? And that means you're going to go into what? Into, what's that? You're going into darkness. This is why if we are here as a church, we can't go back and follow the things that the Hebrews did by slaughtering the lambs and carrying on the feast days. Because we're going into what? Darkness. It was a light for them based upon where they were. But we are in a what? We have greater light. God expects more of us. Right? Make sense? Okay. So, so the experience was obtained through much suffering and severe conflict. It becomes yours. And she says that God led them along how? Step by step until he had placed them on a what? Solid, immovable platform. There's a process in order to get to this step. But if we, if we came into this message at this low, and if we don't have the foundation here, or the foundation here, when the big swelling of the Jordan and that national Sunday low comes out, we can. Will we be able to say, no, we won't. We will buckle because we don't have the proper what? Foundation. We don't have tap roots to prepare us for that time that we have to go through. So he leads us how? Step by step until he gets us to that immovable platform. Right? We see the same thing with all the giants in the Bible of old. They had their steps. He wants to take us to those steps. And he's teaching us a principle here. Because if, if, if Christ is taking us to three steps, guess what? Somebody else has three steps. Hmm? And if God's three steps are designed to what? Bring us higher and higher. What's the purpose of those other three steps? To bring us down. And Satan always wants to be like God. The Bible says he wants to be just like the most high. So whatever God does... Say what? He's the copycat. <laughs> he copies every single thing that Christ does in the wrong direction because he wants to be like God. But it's an antagonistic power that works against righteousness. See that? So we'll see those same three clusters in the Bible where we see that Satan is seeking to bring man down, to degrade man, while Christ is seeking to bring man up. Okay? So, when we look at these three steps, let's back up for just a minute. So, we're told that these are three steps. 
we're told that they're also what? The three angels' messages, I think that, uh, yeah. It's also the three angels' messages. And so what we're seeing here, one of the traits of Christ, he always taught the people using what they knew, what was familiar with, to them, right? And he took those things and he took their minds where? To heavenly things. So he was now putting another principle in place called the natural spiritual principle. Or he's, he's combining the natural and the spiritual. For the purpose of what? Teaching us. Teaching us, right? Okay? And so, so he uses the natural to teach us about the spiritual. And this is very important. Why is it important? This is why. When we go through earthly experience, which is natural, right? Everything that happens on earth is what? It's natural. It naturally happens. So when these things naturally happen, where should our minds go? Is Christ is trying to reshape our minds so that whatever takes place here on earth in our experience, our mind automatically it goes to the spiritual. Why? Because the only way that our minds can be transformed into a holy mind it must be done through this principle. Why do I say that? is because Christ, when he was on, here on earth, Christ taught this principle. He even lived this principle according to Christ's object lessons. Every time he opened his mouth, he spoke in parables. And the Bible says he opened not his mouth unless he did that, right? He always responded to people's questions, but he taught using parables. And he lived it in his life. So his, the expression of his entire life was to teach this nat natural, spiritual principle according to Christ's object lessons, page 14. So that when things happen on earth, automatically our mind is going to spiritual things so that we will do the works of heaven instead of the works of the flesh. You want to share something just now? Maybe if a mic can be brought so the people online can hear what she's saying. If a mic can be brought for her to use. And then everybody else can so. Yeah, I was saying that early writings tell us you know, in reference to what you were saying earlier, um, that you cannot go to the third angel's message. You have to go backwards so you can get a firm foundation. It said, those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. Neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And so... Um, God does things in order. So that my mind just went back to that. Okay, appreciate that. All right, so we just have a couple more slides. So we see this, we already talked about this, the different, uh, the different messages, the different steps. And we see that many different scripture, many things that we already know that's in the Bible is lining up with these same three angels' messages. And I remember reading a statement in Spirit of Prophecy. It says that the work of salvation is done by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that there's three in heaven that bear record, right? And there's also three on earth that bear record. And so we see these clusters of three all throughout the Bible. And God is seeking to teach us. So that as we see those threes, those clusters of three, we know that there's something about that that God wants us to understand. 
Because it has to do with what? Our salvation, right? The plan of salvation. And so he marks that, all right? And um, we already talked about the sanctuary message, the three steps there. And so that will pretty much, as we look at the three steps. So um, we wanted to share that. Uh, wait a minute, let me see. I think. Right. So just going back to this, that point here, it's of vital importance that we need to understand these, these messages in their true and correct uh, understanding. And so it's important that as we go back, um, uh, there's a, so as we go back, we can ask God to help us understand the three angels' messages. And, and when we go back, um, um, what benefit, if I ask the question, what benefit or how do we benefit by going back and learning about the three angels' messages in the past? What's that again? again? We can learn from others' mistakes, and that's correct. That's very, very important because as we go back, we learn learn about how God dealt with his people in time past. And Sister White tells us that in, in, uh, in her first vision, if we read about it, she says that, that God set up a light behind the people, which was the midnight cry. <clears throat> and she says that that light lit up the pathway, lit up the pathway all along to the sea. And so light set it behind them gave them the ability to see what was in front of them, right? And so light allows us to see in what? In darkness. And when we look into the future, what are we looking into? Into darkness. Have, have y'all ever gone to the beach? Have y'all ever snorkeled in the beach? Or, or, or had on goggles in the beach? And have you looked down where you go out to the, to the further into the beach and it gets darker and darker and darker and darker? Have y'all experienced that? Well, you, not necessarily you have to go out that deep, but just look, looking in the water and you look out to where it gets deeper. You can see the flow goes down. If you see it go down, but it starts getting darker. So you can only see so far, right? Now, the first time that I did that, I felt so spooky, so scared, because if I went further into the water, which I can't see, I, I didn't want to strike a sneak upon me and, <laughs> and scare me. So it, it feared me, you know, I was fearful of that. However, the point is that when you look into the deep water, you can't see but so far. It's dark. Light, the purpose of light is to allow you to see in what? In darkness, right? <clears throat> So, when we, <clears throat> oh my, yeah, so those lights allow us to see what's going to happen in the darkness, right? And so we can then prepare. So God is allowing us, as we go through these three angels' messages, which are lights, to allow us to see into the darkness, then we can know what to up ahead and make preparations for it. Um, in response to your question about um, looking in the past, I thought about the quote that says, we have nothing to fear for the future, lest we forget, right. you know, about God's dealings with his people in the past and also his teachings. That's and right. so um, um, I also thought about the text that says that um, that which had been will be. What is now has already taken place and will happen again. And the Bible also says that God requireth that which is past. So pretty much the past is a foundation for what will happen in the future. Correct. So it's important that we do that because it allows us to experience the rain, the early rain. And as we are familiar with the experience of the early experience, the three angels of that took place in the early days of Adventism. Sister White says 
in that same quote, she says that when God gave that vision, God wanted the people to know they were at the beginning of their journey. They were not at the end. Christ was not about to come back. But they were where? At the beginning. Right? And because God requires what? The past, the beginning, it's always going to come back at the end. So then, as we understand what took place in the beginning of Adventism, we're able to have a better understanding of what's going to take place at the ending of Adventism. Why? Because history always what? Repeats itself. So, so when we look at, sorry for kicking that off again, the sanctuary model, the Hebrew people were at the beginning of God's people. They began the work on earth as a nation to teach the world about Christ and coming, right? His first coming. And so the beginning of the Jewish nation had an impact on the way it ended. And the ancient people, the Jewish nation, is the beginning, which will be like the ending of God's people, which is who? Seven Adventists. So the ancient people have a direct bearing upon the spiritual people. We have the natural Jew, we are the what? Spiritual Jew, right? They were the born Jew, we were the adopted Jew, right? So we have the beginning of God's people, we have the ending of God's people. And the same way, the way we began as Adventists are the way we're going to end as Adventists. We were known as the people of the book. We studied God's word. God is going to have a people who really study his word at the end of time. Okay? So we see that history repeats itself and God requires those things. So as we go back and we study the first, second, and third angels, message we close them now then we will be prepared for the latter rain when it comes. Because the only way that we are going to be able to recognize the latter rain is if we are familiar with the early rain. Because when it comes, the difference is it comes with 10 times the power. So as we're familiar with it, we can recognize it, Lord willing, when it comes. And that's why, according to Zechariah 10, one coming to you, hon, Zechariah 10, one says that in the time of the latter rain, what are we to do? We're to ask for it. But Sister White says it's, it, it can be falling all around us, and we never receive it. Why? Because we're unfamiliar with it. So if you don't know God's voice early, before he comes a second time, we will not recognize his voice just prior to him coming. So we need to have a familiarity with the voice of God as he speaks to his children through those messages. You, you, um, you referenced um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit um, in that three steps. Um, what would you say, who would represent the first, who would represent the second, and who would represent the third? There are, as I mentioned, there are the three angels' messages goes throughout time. So there are different references. And so we, we do know that there's a direct reference that Sister White gives that John the Baptist gave the first angels' messages in his time, in the line of Christ. Because his, his message was what? Repent, right? Just like Noah's message was what? A message of repentance. And Christ then was the second angel's message because he repeated the first angel's message. But remember, remember we, we learned that the first angel's message is a life and death message. You remember read that? So, so that first angel's message through John was to prepare people for Christ's first coming, right? And avoid judgment. 
It was a life and death message because the Jews were going to be cut off. They were in the fourth generation, and that's where judgment comes, right? And so probation was about to close. So when Christ came on the scene, they were in the time of their visitation. They were in the time of their judgment. Christ, we're told, is the second angel's message. We saw that the second angel's message is always a visual test. You must see it with your eyes. Just like in Noah's day, the entire antediluvian world saw the animals getting on the ark, which was a work or act of what? Righteousness. That's the second step. The second angel's message. <clears throat> so Christ, when he was on earth, all the Jews saw the miracles that he was doing. They saw it with his, their own eyes. That you have to see it, right? That's it, what? An experience. You must experience it. And so the third step in Christ's line of history, what began at the stoning of Stephen, judgment, began at the stoning of Stephen. And where did it end? It ended at the destruction of what? Jerusalem. Right? So judgment came at that time. So in Christ's line, John the Baptist was the first, Christ was the second, and it began with the stoning of Stephen for judgment, and it ended in the destruction of Jerusalem. Right? So we see that the three angels' message sounded then. Why? Because it was in the time of visitation, it was the fourth generation. For the Jewish nation. And judgment only comes, the three angels' message only sounds in the generation. So, what does that mean to us? As Adventists, guess where we are? We are also in the fourth generation. We can show it. We're in this fourth generation. And if we're in this fourth generation, that means that the three angels' message must sound in our time. Right? Yes. It would have to end when, 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 after, when Christ comes and finishes the work. He finishes his work because he's coming to deliver his people, right, the righteous. And also we know the Bible says that when he comes that his brightness will destroy. So when he comes, he's still he's finishing up his uh, judgment that will take place on the world. So I don't know. I don't know exactly when it's going to take place. We don't know. But, you know, we, we know based upon some information that we've been given that it, it, it's, it's, it's not too much further in, in, the, in the judgment. So when it comes to the, the actual number of, of information that's been given to us, because no, no man knows the day or the hour, but based upon calculation from the death of Christ, it's approximately eight years, I'm sorry, eight years until that time is cut off. However, the Bible says he's going to cut short the righteousness. We don't know when he's going to cut All we do know is there's a short time. We've got to get ready. You know, we don't know when, but we've got to get ready. We've got to get ready, get ready, get ready, because it's soon. It could be longer, it could be less, we don't know. Right? But, um, but we've got to prepare for that time. We've got to prepare. So, um, as we go back in our own personal study, I encourage you, encourage you to go to the Midnight Cry message. <clears throat> we, we didn't do it here. And I'm not sure what, what, what the time frame factor is now, but we're not going to go through it. But we do know, according to that vision that Ella White had, that first vision, she saw people on that pathway that fell off. Remember? Some fell off and some stayed on that pathway. And the difference, what made the difference between those two groups was one thing in addition. It was the midnight cry message. Because some denied it and said it was not God. And, the, and the, we're told that the light went out, they stumbled, and they fell to the wicked world below. But those who kept their eyes on Jesus, they were, she says they were what? Safe. 
So I encourage you, get that Midnight Cry message. It's by Samuel Snow. It's called the True Midnight Cry message. Midnight Cry by Samuel Snow um, and Ellen G. White. Through the pen of inspiration in early writings, she says, the angel told her that that light was the Midnight Cry. The True Midnight Cry message. So I encourage you to get it, study it, know it, and claim it. Because that light allows you to do what? As she says, to see all along the pathway. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus, who is just before us, we will be safe. Sir. You could go online. You can go online, just Google True Midnight Cry by Samuel Snow, and it'll pull up. And also, if you have the CD-ROM, the CD-ROM, just go to Pioneer Writings, type it in, True, the True Midnight Cry message. And if you have a jump drive, I can load it on your, on your drive. I've got it right here. Praise it. Yes. Um, I, I see the quote that you were referencing just now. OK. Um, you want me to share? Well, if you want to. It says, I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. John was sent in the spirit and the power of Elijah to prepare the way for Jesus. Those who rejected the testimony of John were not benefited by the teachings of Jesus. Their opposition to the message that foretold coming placed them where they did not receive the strongest evidence that he was the Messiah. Satan led those who rejected the message of John to still go further to reject and crucify Christ. In doing this, they placed themselves where they could not receive the blessing on the day of Pentecost, which would have taught them the way into the heavenly sanctuary. By rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances would no longer be received. The great sacrifice had been offered and had been accepted. And it goes here to say... The great sacrifice has been offered and accepted, okay? It goes on to say, from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus had entered by his own blood to shed upon the, his disciples the benefits of his atonement. But the Jews were left in total darkness, just like the midnight cry. Um, those who fell off the path, well, those that start re rejecting the truth that lighted up the path, she said that they were left in total darkness. The same message here. They lost all the light which they might have upon the plan of salvation and still trusted in their useless sacrifices and offerings. The sanctuary had taken the place of the earthly, yet they had no knowledge of the change. Therefore, they could not be benefited by the mediation of Christ in the holy place. And then she, she switches. It's amazing. She switches from the natural, talking about Israel and and then she went on to the spiritual, talking about the Millerites. And she talked about those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. And they could not be benefited by the midnight cry, which was also going to show them the way into the most holy place. That's right. So, my guys, as we go back and we get an understanding of those messages, midnight cry. It will put us in a safe place. And as we keep our eyes on Christ, matter of fact, the penetration thing is to be allowed to take our minds away from the three angels' messages. Nothing. Nothing. Amen. That's a loud cry, the, the midnight cry message. It's, 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 yes, it is dealing with that. It certainly is. It certainly is. Matter of fact, it is. It's a culmination of all that were in the first angel. That's right. And remember, that is the, it's the pinnacle point. It's where the people fell off the platform, right? And it is the point in which it, God sets us on a road that will lead us to everlasting life. And so but it, it's very powerful. It's very powerful. So I would encourage everyone to get it, read it, study it, claim it, 
and don't let it go. Amen. I pray you are blessed. Praise him. Praise him. So let's have a word of prayer as we uh, close out. Any, any questions or statements, anything like that? We have a word of prayer as we close. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for your love and your mercy, your goodness and your grace. We thank you for the opportunity that you give to us, Lord, that we can come close to you. We thank you for the patterns that you have shown us, Lord, in your word that, that allows us to know that this is you communicating to us. Because you've told us in medical, in medical ministry, page 20, you said that you, Christ rather, Christ is the pattern man. And he uses patterns to teach us, to let us know that that is his signature. So thank, thank you for these paths that help us to know that you are leading us and guiding along the way. And as we see you work in history, the same way over and over and over again, it assures us how you will work with us and it helps us to build confidence that you will do exactly what you say when you say. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Amen. I hope that was a blessing. Yes. Thank you, brother, for helping to. Uh, did you have something you want to say, brother? Yeah, this is on YouTube. It's going to be saved on uh, YouTube and you can access it on the, the live tab of our YouTube page. And we optimized the live streaming last night. So it's looking a lot better. So praise the Lord. We're excited about that. We had some issues for some time with the 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 live stream and the, the upload. So anyway, does anyone have anything that they would like to say in regards to that or any testimonies that they would like to say? We have a uh, lunch coming up here in the other room on this side in about 15 minutes. So um, you guys are more than welcome to join us. Would you like to say something? Moses Mason, you heard of him, of course, yeah. And uh, I don't know, is this uh, working? Yeah, it's working now. And uh, from 1844, 40 years. 40 years is a generation in the Bible. From 1844 to 2024, completed the fourth generation. So he figured that... Uh, uh, it's, uh, a, but you didn't sound like you were buying into that. The direction that we're going is is a principle that's found in Christ like Blessings. And uh, there's a principle that's found in Christ Object Lessons. We see that principle enacted in, in reality in the existence of this world. We see that enacted at the cross. What that principle is, we mentioned here, is the natural spiritual principle. Christ object lessons.